Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, for those who are coming in now, welcome to our uh, webinar on the impact and future of Russia sanctions. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items before we begin. Uh, you will be able to type questions into the either the Q&A or the chat. Uh, we will answer those questions uh, uh, after we hear from our three speakers. So please, as you as your questions, uh, as you think of your questions, please type them in and then we'll get to them uh, towards in the second half of our webinar. Uh, my name is Oris Zakadalski. I'm the senior policy advisor for the Ukrainian Canadian Congress. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I will turn it over to our moderator, uh, Elizabeth Brow, who is the, a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, uh, where she focuses on defense against emerging national security challenges, such as hybrid and gray zone threats. She is a columnist with foreign policy, where she writes on national security and the globalized economy. Uh, and she is the author of The Defender's Dilemma, Identifying and Deterring Gray Zone Aggression, and God Spies, the Stasi's Cold War Espionage Campaign Inside the Church. Um, before joining the American Enterprise Institute, Ms. Brow was a senior research fellow at the Royal United Services Institute in London, where she founded and led its Modern Deterrence Project. She has also worked for Control Risks, a global risk consultancy. Uh, she began her career as a journalist, reporting on Europe for the Christian Science Monitor, Newsweek, and the International Metro Group of Newspapers, among others. In addition to foreign policy, she is often published in the New York Times, or sort of New York, the Financial Times, Politico, and Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, uh, and the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Ms. Brau attended the University of Hagen in Germany, graduating with an MA in political science and German literature. So Ms. Brau, thank you for uh, agreeing to moderate today and I turn it over to you for the duration. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's so nice to see you all. I see a, a, a fantastic number of attendees. Uh, it's fantastic to, to uh, not just to, to have you interested in this panel, but to have you interested in the really crucial subject of how uh, effective our uh, the West sanctions against Russia are because if uh, that's uh, something that surely needs measuring uh, to know how we should proceed. And I'm also delighted uh, to be sharing the screen, if not the room, with a fantastic panel. And uh, I will start by introducing Alexandra Chichnit, who is the president, national president of the Ukrainian Canadian Congress. And I have to read here uh, from, my, from my sheet so I get all the details right. Um, uh, she has served in this capacity uh, since 2018. And uh, previously she was the first, a first vice president of the UCC. And she has a long history of serving uh, in the UCC and serving in the Ukrainian Canadian community more widely. And um, she has also worked on uh, on the Canadian Civil Liberties in this Canadian Civil Liberties Association. She will speak first, but since she will be immediately followed by three other speakers, I will take the liberty to introduce them as well. Uh, they may need no introduction, but I'll highlight some of their achievements. Anyway, I'm followed by my almost namesake, uh, Bill Browder, who is the CEO of Hermitage Capital Management and uh, head of the Global Magnitsky Justice Campaign. Uh, of course, uh, of great fame as an investor in foreign investor in Russia uh, in the 90s and early 2000s until he was expelled from the country and subsequently continued his work in London, uh, in addition to his work uh, as part of the founding the Magnitsky campaign for justice for Sergei Magnitsky and, uh, and for uh, Russian dissidents more widely. Uh, then uh, we have Brian O'Toole, who is a senior non resident a fellow at the Atlantic Council and has worked uh, for many or worked for many years at, at OFAC, uh, the, the Office of Foreign Assets Control in the US, which is of course a, a mighty uh, arm of the US government that looks after sanctions compliance. And I can tell, uh, I, I, I can report from experience uh, having worked in the private sector that every 
everybody worries about being uh, being fined or worse by OFAC. So we look forward to having uh, to hearing what what Brian has to say. Uh, we also have, I should say, uh, immediately. Uh, following me, uh, Lloyd Axworthy, who is, of course, uh, of, of uh, great fame as a Canadian politician, and I, I consider it that we are in a Canadian setting here. I don't think I need to have, highlight his uh, achievements more uh, in more detail, rather if, apart from saying that he has done and is doing great work for refugees worldwide and has done so, for example, uh, as part of the Bosch Stiftung, uh, Stiftung um, Fellowship in uh, Germany. I think it's the uh, Richard von Weizsäcker Fellowship specifically in Germany. And, and of course, uh, Ukrainian refugees uh, concern us greatly today, about six and a half million of them at this point. Um, so with that, I will turn the floor over to um, some introductory remarks by Alexandra, then I'll come back and bring the others in. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, on behalf of the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, I wanted to thank everyone for joining us today. Our distinguished panelists will share their considerable insight on the impact and future course of uh, Russia sanctions. Uh, as we all know, Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine began 118 days ago. In that time, Canada, the US, the UK, and the EU have implemented several rounds of sanctions. And while these sanctions have impacted the Russian economy, which uh, is projected to shrink by about 10% this year, the Ukrainian economy ha has been much more battered by Russia's war it is projected to shrink by 40 to 50%. And moreover, while Western nations provide billions of dollars of aid to Ukraine, Russia continues to earn billions of dollars uh, in uh, gas revenues, uh, over 100 billion since uh, February. And 60% of that comes from the European Union. Um, whose reliance, frankly, on Russian energy has fueled and financed Russia's war against Ukraine. Um, this reliance uh, is a grave security threat to the NATO alliance. So today we'll discuss what more our governments can do to address these problems, what sanctions should be used, and how we can ensure their effective enforcement. But before we begin, I wanted to take a moment to remember all the innocents whose lives have been cut short by the unprovoked and vicious attack on Ukraine. May their memory be eternal. Join me in a moment of silence. Thank you very much. We look forward to an interesting and very timely discussion. Thank you, Alexandra. And at this point, I want to bring in Marcus Kolga, uh, well known uh, to all, I think, uh, well known uh, disinformation, misinformation uh, analyst who is uh, uh, plays a, a key role in, in our academic community and beyond in, in uh, highlighting uh, influence campaigns and trying to find ways of uh, limiting their influence. So over to you, Marcus. Well, thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you to the uh, UCC and ORIS for leading the organization of this important discussion. On behalf of the Central and Eastern European Council in Canada and the McDonald Laurie Institute, I want to thank Bill, Mr. Axworthy, Mr. O'Toole, and of course, Elizabeth for agreeing to join us today. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Canadian government for working with our allies to coordinate sanctions targeting the Putin regime and the corrupt officials and oligarchs who enabled the Russian government's repression and its invasion of Ukraine over the past four months. Uh, Canada adopted the Sergei Magnitsky law five years ago. Um, aside from the past months, implementation of our sanctions have been very slow and overall enforcement of our sanctions regime has, has lagged. Uh, amendments to our existing legislation have been tabled in Parliament to update our current legislation with greater transparency and reporting on how our sanctions are applied. Most importantly, the freezing assets for the Frozen Assets for Purposing Act um, will allow our government to use seized oligarch assets to support Ukraine and its long term reconstruction. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to hearing the views of our panelists about the impact of Western sanctions and how we might improve our sanctions legislation and policies to make them more effective. And thank you, of course, to all of our viewers. 
Thank you, Marcus. And I think in true democratic fashion, we'll proceed in alphabetic order, uh, which means I will bring in uh, Lloyd Axworthy first, and he will speak for a few minutes, followed by uh, Bill Browder for a few minutes, then Brian O'Toole. And after that, you will have to bear with me again and uh, more excitingly uh, here uh, and uh, discuss the, the questions that I see are already coming in. So uh, over to you, Mr. Axworthy. Uh, well, thank you. And again, I'm uh, pleased to be part of this uh, discussion. It's timely and necessary because the question of sanctions, uh, I think, is up for serious uh, debate and discussion about uh, next steps. Uh, let me just give a background. Uh, back when I was in foreign affairs, I chaired a, a committee uh, of the Security Council on sanctions, but we actually had time to look at what works and what doesn't. And I think the uh, the overall record was mixed. Um, and I think that we're seeing that clearly in the application of, in the Russian invasion. Uh, there's no doubt it's having uh, impacts on certain economic uh, metrics and conditions in Russia. If anyone thinks, however, it's going to change uh, Mr. Putin's mind about the invasion and the atrocities, uh, then uh, we better find another uh, model and a formula. Uh, sanctions are very difficult to target, especially when you have an autocratic system of government, which is immune from all kinds of uh, public pressures and interest pressures. And I think Putin has been able to surround himself through secret police, through surveillance, through control of the media, to the point where uh, the ability of sanctions to affect people's uh, response is very limited. What I think is uh, a potential was just mentioned, and that is that the application of the uh, freezing of assets and repurposing them uh, towards those who have been victimized by sanctions is one of the key cards that we have to play. Let me explain that I, I chair the World Refugee Migration Council, and we actually put forward this idea about three years ago that the combination of repurposing assets towards those, <coughs> excuse me, such as refugees, such as those who are displaced, such as those who've been harmed and injured, well, I guess is really the old uh, Robin Hood uh, philosophy that you uh, take from those uh, who have begotten and, uh, and turn it to those who have been begat. And I think that uh, one of the key issues right now, the Canadian legislation is modeled very much on what we had put forward uh, in a Senate legislation, one of our council members, Senator, Older bar put forward. And I think it did uh, in conversations with finance and with uh, as a sort of Minister Friedland's office uh, indicated that in order to really uh, both hold accountable uh, the Russian leadership uh, for the horrible sort of discussion is that uh, the sanctions have to bite. They simply can't sit uh, in a bank or the trust fund or frozen. I think they have to come back and provide a very significant sort of uh, curvature uh, of people's income. That's when people will start paying attention. In Canada, for example, we know that there are several Russian oligarchs. I have there's examples even in my own city of Winnipeg, which have very large holdings. And yet uh, so far there's been very little in the way of both attaching and redirecting them and we're talking, uh, let me just give you an, an example. When we were working on this concept uh, and had interesting conversations with the World Bank, we're to, in, in pre-Russian invasion days, they estimated that something 20 to $30 billion a year were part of the frozen assets. And I give uh, Bill Browder and the Magnitsky thing great credit for that. But we have to take it one step further. That money now has to be put to work both in uh, helping support uh, the uh, refugee displacement of Ukrainians. It has to be put to work towards the supply of uh, rebuilding and redevelopment that's going on. And it also has to be sort of uh, really targeted very much at those who are in, in a position that uh, they can have an impact on, on some thinking within uh, the Kremlin. Uh, let me add one further point. 
uh, in the work that we did at the, United, at the Security Council, and I say we are, as a, the Canadian government, one of the things that came clear that sanctions have to work, that not as a sole uh, sort of uh, formula, as a methodology. They have to be accompanied uh, by other uh, equally effective efforts uh, of accountability and of, of responsibility. For example, one of the things I think is lagging behind, and this is something I hope the Ukrainian con Canadian Congress will pick up more actively, is the effort to really hold uh, Russian sort of uh, Putin, his crowd, uh, generals and military people responsible for war crimes. There has been investigations going on for four months. Uh, I know that uh, Mayor Garland has gone to Ukraine today to start examining the war crimes thing, but the United States has been very slow because I think they, they were not uh, very much in favor of uh, the application of war crimes uh, when we developed the Rome Statue in the International Criminal Court. I just want to give you one example. It works. Uh, when I was foreign minister, I was part of a, a group in Europe that were dealing with the uh, invasion and the uh, ethnic cleansing that the Serbs were doing in Kosovo. Um, the Balkan tri Tribunal indicted Milosevic and six of his uh, sort of confederates. Uh, very quickly, they came to the table. They lost a lot of a basic sort of support and uh, affiliation within their own governing scheme. I think that the uh, effort to substantially apply uh, and put into place serious indictments of war crimes will also have a corollary effect uh, that should accompany our sanctions issue. Uh, there's two or three other ideas I can have and we can maybe come back to them, but I think the point is that sanctions by themselves are gonna have very limited impact in the immediate term in terms of what really is happening in terms of decision-making. Uh, Putin is going to do everything possible. And I think that in the meantime, we have to make sure that we step in and uh, provide the, the firewalls against any further uh, extreme atrocities that he will commit. And I think that that is going to require uh, both the, uh, let's just say taking the piggy banks away from the oligarchs and from Mr. Putin himself and start putting it back to work to support Ukrainians. Thank you very much. Uh, Bill Browder, are the sanctions biting? You are muted. Okay, um, I'm unmuted. Uh, as some of you know, I, um, I've spent the last decade of my life focusing, focusing exclusively on trying to apply sanctions against the Putin regime, um, driven by the, or motivated by the uh, murder of my lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky. <clears throat> and from, from a variety of different standpoints, um, uh, I can say that sanctions are working. Before we ever got to the war in Ukraine, uh, Vladimir Putin was so angry with the passage of the Magnitsky Act that he made it his single largest foreign policy priority to try to repeal that. When I, and when I say that, I, 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 he actually wrote it down in a policy paper. Uh, uh, the, the more visible part of that whole thing was uh, him banning the adoption of Russian orphans by American families. And, and for me, the most visible option was him chasing me around the world, um, trying to arrest me and kill me with eight Interpol arrest warrants and asking Donald Trump at the Helsinki summit to hand me over. And so we, we know that there's, that there's something very sensitive about um, personal sanctions, about going after his personal money. And, um, and for, for a decade, I traveled the world trying to get countries to uh, pass Magnitsky Acts and, and then sanction people. And um, uh, many countries did, including Canada. Um, uh, but they didn't use the Magnitsky Act um, nearly enough. In fact, Canada stopped using the Magnitsky Act in 2018 after a several set of sanctions and hasn't used it since then. Um, but more generally, on 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 the topic of sanctions, sa sanctions serve two possible purposes. Either they can act as a deterrent or they can act as a punishment. And I, I would argue that had we been more robust in uh, going after Putin before the war in Ukraine, based on all the other terrible things he's done, um, like 
invading Georgia, taking Crimea, shooting down MH17, poisoning the Skripals, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if we had actually applied sanctions earlier and he saw that that was something that could happen and realistically could happen, he might have had a different calculus about uh, going into Ukraine. He might not have gone in at all, or he might have gone in in a different way. Um, but we didn't do that. And so sanctions didn't act as a deterrent. And so then the only other purpose of sanctions is as a punishment. And again, it's um, this is not about um, uh, you know some type of schoolmasterly things trying to punish him after the fact. The purpose of sanctions at this point is to dry up his financial resources so he can't continue to kill Ukrainians. And in this respect, there are two two areas we need to look at. We 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 can look at the assets of the Putin regime, and we can look at the income of the Putin regime. On the asset side, I think we've done a pretty good job. We uh, the uh, Western allies have sanctioned, or, or, or I should say, frozen uh, 350 billion of the 650 billion of, of central bank reserves that Russia holds, which is pretty impressive. Um, and the Western governments have sanctioned roughly 35 of the 118 richest oligarchs, which again is pretty impressive. It's not 118, but the 35 they've sanctioned are all high value targets who hold a lot of assets, and I believe hold a lot of assets for Vladimir Putin. But the, the elephant in the room is the income. Uh, while we are busy freezing the assets of the Putin regime, which is helpful and, and important and, and definitely something that he he doesn't like, and we know he doesn't like it, um, he still gets a billion dollars a day from the sale of oil and gas to Europe and, and other places. And it costs him about a billion dollars a day to uh, fight the war and kill Ukrainians. And so as long as that can, can carries on, um, even with the most punishing sanction of assets, um, we still have this problem. And so we're, how do we stop um, people from buying Russian oil? Well, I think that, that the Europeans have made some efforts to do that. They've, they've said they're going to stop buying the oil before the end of the year, and that, gets about, that, that eats into about 20% of the billion dollars a day. But there's still the gas, and that's a much harder nut to crack. And so I would argue that the, probably the, the biggest and most important thing that we can do in the West right now is a policy of bringing down um, the oil price. And how do we do that? Well, um, it comes from uh, doing everything in a, from a policy perspective to get more oil being pumped. Um, that, that could be um, uh, trying to put pressure on the Saudis to pump more oil, which I think we have the leverage. And I say we, I think the United States has the leverage to do. Uh, that, that their, their implicit deal with the West over the last 60 or 70 years has been stability in oil prices in exchange for military protection. And they haven't provided the stability in oil prices, and it's their, their, it's their duty to do so. And if they don't, then, then we have some leverage to um, put on them. Um, we can also be pumping a lot more oil in, in the United States and in Canada. Um, we can be using, uh, we can be uh, putting government policies together um, to use uh, other types of alternative energy. And I do believe that this is going to work. I think that, that, that if you, oil prices aren't going to stay above $100 a barrel into perpetuity. And when they come down, that, 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 that's Putin, Putin's war machine will, will not have the money. If oil prices are at $30 or $40, he won't be able to afford to do this. And so I think that sort of looking out strategically and broadly, that has to be our objective, which is to bring the oil price down, both from a market perspective and a policy perspective, so that he can't afford to do this anymore. Thank you very much. Uh, Brian O'Toole, what should we do that we haven't, we meaning Western governments, what should Western governments do that, 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 they, that they aren't already doing? And for everybody, this is your chance to get uh, uh, the secret juice. <laughs> well, I think uh, I, I think Lloyd and Bill have, have laid it out quite well. I mean, I think what I seized on with Lloyd's comments is, is something that I talk about quite a lot, which is sanctions are not a policy unto themselves, right? They have to be coupled with other things, um, and the without kind of the military piece of this, this doesn't work. Um, and then Lloyd also mentioned quite eloquently the, the piece about having to take care of the Ukrainian refugees, which is of utmost importance um, given the, the level of destruction that we've seen and, and the level of destruction we have not seen, right, especially in places like Mariupol. So the key is that sanctions have to work alongside all of these things. I, 
I am a little bit um, more skeptical than than maybe Bill is about the ability of sanctions and, and declining revenues to really impact the kind of on the ground war machine, at least in the short term for Vladimir Putin. I think Putin has made the decision, um, you know, had made the decision a long time ago to move forward with this, regardless of what the consequences were going to be. And I think they had some understanding in Moscow of what they would be, but there was this, I kept hearing this in the run up, right? From November, December, January timeframe, I kept hearing this, this drumbeat from certain people who knew other folks in, in Russia that there were the Siloviki surrounding Putin who thought, well, we can just go back to the Soviet days in the 80s, right? We're gonna be under sanctions, the world's not gonna like us very much, but we're gonna continue to sell grain, we're gonna continue to sell oil and, and gas, and we can survive that way, right? Bunker mentality, you know, and I think I think that's a fundamental misunderstanding of how integrated the financial system is these days, how integrated world trade is. Um, and so I think they have underestimated some of the impact of these sanctions, especially the freezing of the, the central bank reserves, which was a, a kind of landmark uh, event in, in, you know, kind of G7 politics in a lot of ways. I mean, the G7 taking that action together on a Saturday evening was really, really remarkable. Um, but fundamentally, the question in the short term is still military. Right? What are the shipments? What do the supplies look like? What is what is Ukraine's resistance to Russia look like? And does Ukraine get to to try to negotiate from a position of strength, or does the world have to negotiate with Moscow um, from Moscow's position of strength in kind of territory in Ukraine? And I think that's where the crux of this is is going to come down. Because even if the oil price can drop, we're talking about that taking you know maybe six, eight months at, at a best case scenario, right? Um, what is, you know, if, if Putin is in control of Kyiv at that point, this is a very different ball. Game. So I think, I think the short term focus has to be immediately on, on the kind of, you know, sustainability of the military campaign in Ukraine, diplomatic um, and, uh, and, and military liaison support, and intelligence sharing and things of those nature are, are critically important for the, the battle on the ground. And then the sanctions, in my view, have to pivot to more of a, a sustainable long-term solution, right? There was this hectic, frantic, um, pick your ick word, uh, run up in, uh, in February, March, April of this kind of massive sanctions from many, many major Western economies, and I'm including Japan in that, um, that is really unprecedented given the, the, the scale of Russia's economy being so much larger than anything else. The world has ever gone after. Iran is the only thing that kind of has a comparable run up in, in modern, modern history. And Iran's economy was a fraction of Russia's uh, before sanctions in, in both places. So I think sanctions need to move into this more kind of longer term stable, right? They've got to keep a drumbeat. You have to try to try to keep some of the, the drumbeat of sanctions alive. Um, strategically, I have questions about just how important going after oligarch assets really is since the oligarchs I don't see, think have that much impact on Putin, but as a drumbeat for keeping keeping the rally around the flag effect um, in the West, which which Putin enjoys simply by having military um, action in Ukraine and, and you know total control over the airwaves, um, seizing a yacht is an, an easy thing to demonstrate. It's a lot easier to talk about seizing a yacht than I saw somebody put in the chat earlier than the, uh, the ruble valuation or even ruble spreads, right, which are in some ways more meaningful than, than the valuation itself. You start getting into these wonky economic terms, it's difficult to, to really convey a sense of success, right? What are, what are Russia's non-performing loans look like? What are, what are Russian imports look like? Those are hard things to translate to the ordinary people. Seizing Alisher's Monov's $600 million yacht is a hell of a lot easier. Um, and so I think those are the things. Keeping that drumbeat is important. Trying to find a way to, if, if there's no way to, ta to take Russian energy off the table because prices are too high and and a global depression is not necessarily in anybody's best interest, um, despite the, the horrific scenes that we see in Ukraine. Um, talking about ways to take Russian revenues or at least usable revenues off, right? If Russia can only trade that energy with say India and China and racks up a bunch of Indian rupees and Chinese yuan, Russia may not be able to do very much with that currency. The West has tools to make that happen by cutting off the, the conversion of that through the dollar or the euro so that that Russia doesn't have anything it can kind of tangibly use. Um, you know, so some of these things, I think it's keeping the focus there. And then that, 
you know, actions targeting Putin's inner circle, I think are, are, are important for messaging, not only uh, to domestic audiences, but, but to Putin himself. And, and, and indeed, I think Lloyd's point about um, going after the war crimes is, is really crucial. Um, you know, those consequences have to be there. Sitting behind a prison, you know, sitting behind bars in a prison in the Hague for the rest of your life needs to be a real possibility um, for these leaders in Russia to, to start chipping away at some of the, you know, kind of the, the impervious army that Putin's built around himself uh, domestically. Thank you very much. And on that note, uh, there are there is a specific question uh, that has come in, and I, I, a challenge to myself and to to uh, the panelists is to get as many questions and answers is into the uh, remaining twenty one minutes of of uh, this part of the event. Then we'll have five minutes for uh, for. Uh, our hosts to uh, draw uh, lessons from what has been discussed, but uh, here is a question maybe for, for you all and, and, and uh, specifically for, for you, Brian. After four months, have all Western countries now sanctioned enough oligarchs? So uh, challenge to you, uh, answer in, in about 60 seconds or, or um, less. Yeah, again, I think the oligarch sanctions don't have that much of a direct impact on Vladimir Putin. Um, and so I think the, the, the utility of them is, is showing progress, showing continued attention by Western governments. Um, like it or not, government's attention span wanes just like anybody else, right? Um, senior leaders have other priorities, other issues, elections happening in France and in other places. The U.S. is going to be coming up on one with huge inflation numbers here for us. Um, that's going to be a big problem for President Biden domestically. So in my view, the oligarch sanctions are, are in some ways, um, you know, more of more of showing that publicly, uh, you know, you're, you're still paying attention to what's going on in Ukraine and you still care about it, that constant drumbeat that I talked about. So from the oligarch sanctions standpoint, you don't have to do them all at once. I think saving them so that you can kind of roll them out on a, on a you know, kind of basis that uh, that keeps that public attention is, is to me the most important from kind of a sustainability of sanctions and policy on this, on this issue. Thank you. Uh, could, 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 I, could I make a comment? I, I, I have to say that I, I don't agree with the idea that the sanctions are sort of uh, really uh, ancillary. I would like the other members of the panel to address the question because it's going to be addressed at the G7 meetings in about two weeks, and that is the repurposing of assets. The oligarchs, uh, I'm not talking about yachts and airplanes i'm talking about significant billions of dollars that are being held oftentimes being held in in escrow uh, for putin himself and i think the idea of being able to attach those assets put them through the right kind of judicial process as is part of the canadian legislation uh, that's been tabled and has been passed by the house of commons and utilize that on a much broader basis amongst many more countries. By the way, the Swiss have already done that, and it has a, a very direct impact because it's not just a signal, it's also uh, basically you're draining the piggy bank for all these people, and uh, so they can't live comfortably that sometime it's all gonna come back into their hands. I think there is both the uh, punishment angle, but there's also very much a reward angle. Look. Ukraine is really up against the wall. Every single day, more money is required for ammunition, for weapons, uh, for, for food. We haven't talked about the food security, by the way. And I think what needs to happen, there has to be an infusion of new reserves and investment, because at some point there's gonna be a level of fatigue coming out of the, uh, the countries that so far have supported Ukrainian effort. Uh, it's already clear in the European, uh, I mean, look what happened. Macron and uh, uh, so all of Sochi all go to there and they don't carry anything. Uh, the only thing they offer was 15 new houses. There was no indication about a long-term sustainable plan for Ukraine to maintain its stability uh, economically and socially. And I think one thing we have to look at is what are the new sources of funds? The new sources of funds are for those who have been gouging uh, off uh, the, the returns in Ukraine and Russia and, and actually so many other places. So I think that's something 
that I, I would hope that Congress might uh, begin to focus on because I think it is something that takes the sanctions to a different level from where they are where, where they are right now. Thank you. Uh, a completely different question uh, uh, about uh, uh, energy prices. Um, let me read it out here. Uh, what about the idea by Sergei Guriev at Science Po, uh, the, the Russian economist now in, living in Europe or li living in, in Western Europe, I should say, uh, of capping the price that is paid by Europeans for Russian oil and gas? This seems very promising. Anybody? Want to tackle that one? Okay, I'm going to assign Brian to that one, and then I have one for uh, Mr. Browder after that. Sure, I would have. I would have been happy to defer to Bill if, if he wanted to jump in on this. Um, I I'm a little skeptical of this idea of imposing an artificial price cap based on you know whether it's marginal cost of production in in Russia or whatever. Um, I think fundamentally, right, the, the concern that Western governments have is that going after Russian energy in a traditional way is going to spike prices even further, drive global inflation, um, you know, put, put the US and other Western economies into recession. Um, I think imposing a, an artificial price cap that has no clear or kind of presidential verification mechanism, no idea about what the US or, or the West will do to, to enforce that, will still cause a price spike. Um, it may not be quite as high as, as kind of formally taking Russian exports off the table via sanctions, but I, I think there's still going to be enough uncertainty in a market that's very skittish, very tight, not just on the kind of production, but in particular on the refining capacity side of things. Um, the market is incredibly tight at the moment, and I, I think this is an idea that has a lot of downsides because you're kind of introducing an artificial mechanism into a market that otherwise functions with some relative effects, effectiveness. Um, and, and so I think I think there are other ways to go after it. I, I mentioned before the idea of preventing convertibility of, of funds and exports, right? Russia doesn't have a lot of use for Chinese yuan. It can't easily make use of that. Um, it doesn't have a lot of use for Indian rupees or at least excess in excess of what they make now. And so cutting off some of the ability to convert those funds back through the US dollar or the Euro where most most of those transactions are going to have to go through those those steps anyway, and to get back into rubles, to me is a more effective idea um, and and one with fewer downsides because the implementation is essentially just through banks, which is a kind of known quantity rather than this kind of nebulous idea of, of putting in place a market price cap that that really has no great precedent. Uh, just a note to all the attendees, I see there is a lively chat going on in the chat function, which is, uh, which is uh, great. Uh, just if, if you have a specific question, uh, it's, it's easy for me to see it if you put it in, in the Q&A uh, box. So on that note, I have two questions I'd like to address to, uh, to Lloyd Axworthy and Bill Browder. Uh, one, uh, the first one is one of the panelists mentioned a figure of $100 billion um, that Russia has earned from the sale of oil and gas since the beginning of the sanctions. On the other hand, the, the assets frozen by the US, the UK and the EU amount to $350 billion. Do you believe the sanctions really work? Is there anything else that can be done to stop Putin? This is a, a very large question, but uh, if you could maybe address that, that uh, disparity between the money that goes into to the Russian economy and how much we're able to freeze. And on that note also, somebody, uh, uh, one of our, of our uh, participants is asking, how, how, what is the quantity of Russian assets located in the West? So maybe uh, Bill Browder, over to you first on this one. So the, um, uh, over the last 22 years, Putin and his cronies have stolen a trillion dollars from the Russian state and keep it in the Actually. West. Um, and so they're, they're, uh, they're keeping it in the West. And um, that money was, was sort of rainy day money. And now it's a rainy day as far as uh, he's concerned. And, and um, uh, so, what, so I, think, I think we need to sort of put, put the, there's two buckets. There's the official state money, the central bank reserves, uh, Putin's war chest. That was 650 billion. 
350 billion of that has been frozen. And then we have the trillion dollars of offshore money, rainy day money, keep safe money. And uh, I, I don't think that much more than like 50 billion of that has been frozen. The oligarchs have for very many years have been anticipating somebody coming after their money for some reason. Most of the time they were just afraid of each other. And so they've used high, high quality asset protection schemes uh, engineered by the best lawyers and so on. Uh, uh, and, and I think that that's going to be, it's going to be a hard struggle for the West to figure out where that money is because these guys have hidden it um, so well. Um, coming to the, the, to the so, so that, that, that's, and, and again, this is savings. This is money that they've put away. And, and, and Putin's logic is very simple. His logic is that, that as long as he has money coming in on a daily basis to continue to pay for stuff, um, he can worry about the savings later. And, and he believes, and he's a very cynical man, he believes that by jacking up the price of oil, by jacking up the price of food, by creating all sorts of other crises, potentially you have a starvation crisis in Africa, it creates all sorts of refugees, that we in the West and Europe and, and everywhere else um, will grow, um, you know, will end up in, in our democracies um, having, you know, electing new leaders. I mean, look in France, they had something like 89 members of the National Assembly were from uh, Marine Le Pen's party, moving up from eight before. Um, uh, you know, Donald Trump could easily be reelected in 2024. There's all sorts of scenarios and possibilities where you end up with a new head of state in, an, in a ma major Western country. And then all of a sudden, the Western alliance fractures. All of a sudden, everybody is tired of, of uh, high prices, tired of inflation, blaming it on the Russians. And, um, and they say, well, let's just um, ease the sanctions. And so Putin is a very cynical guy. He thinks that, that um, he'll still be sitting there in five years from now and the money will be unfrozen. And, uh, and that's really the, um, the scary thing. I mean, and, and, it's, and it's not unrealistic. And, and um, time is on his side, it's not on ours. And so, you know, it kind of raises the um, you know, urgency of doing as much as we can as soon as we can before the, before our, the, the Western Alliance fractures. Uh, if, I, if I could respond, I think one of the points that uh, Bill Bauer just made is very important, that uh, Putin and those around him are counting on being able to recover uh, those frozen assets. That's why I think the basic sort of objective of seizing and repurposing, so they're no longer in the piggy bank, has a much more dramatic impact than simply keeping them sort of in the vault. I still come back to the basic point that uh, it, it seems to me that we're not really putting our heads around. And that is that there is a very large quantum of identifiable money. The ability to do forensic investigations has already been proven. The Swiss have been working on this kind of model for the last couple of years. In Canada, we have been developing evidentiary basis by which you can both identify and attach and go through a proper judicial process uh, to redirect. And so I think that uh, for some reason or other, we seem to be avoiding or trying to skate around that issue. I'm not sure why, but my point is, I think that it's a, it is something that is going to be addressed at the G7 meetings. And I think that the ability of, of, of the powerful voice of the Ukrainian Congress uh, to be able to pro provide a basis of support for that, I think would be a very sort of uh, supportive and conducive uh, to these kinds of efforts. I also want to make, just to use the opportunity, because I know our time is running out, we haven't talked about the reverse sanctions, because Putin is, is basically uh, applying his own sanctions on the delivery of food. The, uh, the embargo and, and the boycotting of Ukrainian grain for the rest of the world, uh, I think, is causing enormous repercussions in all kinds of places. There is an answer to that, which is to vet uh, a UN Uniting for Peace resolution through the General Assembly to set up an international uh, peace force in the Black Sea to accompany and monitor and protect for the transfer of grain into the norm, into the kind of markets that are so desperately hungry right now. 
Now, here's the question. Well, isn't Putin going to continue to slash and burn? Well, I think he would have to reconsider. He's not going to be attacking Americans or Canadian or French or Brits. He's going to be attacking Uruguayans and Indonesians and Chileans who are all part of an international force. You know, I think we have to start thinking out of the box a little bit. I mean, I think the discussion so far has been constrained inside sort of what I think are convent or conventional wisdom. I think if you're really going to try to stop what's going on, and this is not some long-term gain, I think uh, uh, we're quite right. The, the, the long-term gain will be at Ukraine's loss. And you already have people suggesting that it's time for them to concede and, and negotiate. If you really want to stop it now, you're going to have to undertake actions that provoke and get an action that really sort of stand up and say, okay, now you've got some real different sets of issues to, to deal with. Uh, you know, I was in diplomacy for, I don't know how many years as a Canadian foreign minister. And I just simply know that you can do soft power, but at some times you have to harden that up a little bit. And I think that's the kind of conversation that we need to have. Otherwise, I think uh, it's just gonna dribble away uh, because right now, the application of the sanctions as they are right now is not directly affecting Putin's decision on the war. And in the meantime, his sanctions against the supply of food for the rest of the world is having very serious and negative political repercussions in terms of you know, providing international endorsement for continued action to support Ukraine. Thank you. There are two more questions I'd like to take in the remaining five minutes, and so I'll challenge the, the uh, our panelists to to answer them, to pick one and answer it in 60 seconds or less. And the first one is, are there additional measures that governments can implement to facilitate tracing, freezing and repurposing of assets, for example, requiring information sharing and disclosure of individual shareholders. Mr. Browder's books illustrate how difficult it is to follow the tangled webs of shell companies uh, to the assets themselves. Second question, how realistic is it for Europe to become independent of Russian gas? So starting with you, Mr. Browder, pick, feel free to pick one and uh, uh, off you go. Um, so I, I've got this um, very controversial idea, which I'm marketing uh, to lawmakers around the world, which is that we're never going to find the the um, uh, Russian money um, if uh, under the current circumstances. Basically, these guys are so good at hiding their money. Um, they've taken such good advice. They've been preparing this for this for so long that the only way that we'll succeed in doing this is if we um, pass a very simple amendment to all the sanctions laws. Um, and the amendment says that any person, any enabler, any a lawyer accountant, trustee, banker, advisor, who helped the Russian oligarchs set up these structures, um, if, there, if that oligarch is sanctioned, would be under a duty of law to come forward to the government and share information about where the assets are and how they're structured. And so to effectively to take the entire asset protection industry and turn it into a Russian oligarch whistleblowing industry. And um, when I suggest this to um, ministers in different governments, they they say, "Yeah, that's a that's that's a pretty that's kind of obvious. That's a no brainer." And so that's kind of what I think would would be a very major um, game changer in, in in how we could actually find their stuff. It would. It seems uh, entirely straightforward. So so. Uh... If we have learned nothing else from this, we have learned a lot from these uh, 50 minutes, but that is, I think, an idea we can all take forward in our respective countries. Uh, Brian, I'll let you go next, pick one, and uh, answer in 60 seconds. Sure. Um, I might be able to actually get two of these. I think I think on the, the repurposing of assets question, and, and Lloyd, I'm not dodging that because I have anything else to add to what you say. I think you're, you're spot on. It, it needs to be out there. I think the, the critical piece is proper judicial procedures, right? Because sanctions in all of these jurisdictions that we're talking about rely on essentially an asset freezing, which is not quite a seizure. But in the U.S., it, it has all sorts of borders with the Fourth and Fifth Amendments um, to our Constitution here. And so that proper judicial procedure needs to be there. That said, existing current procedure in the United States is way too slow and is almost inoperable in terms of, and we have precedent in this in anti-corruption investigations um, where a, a government is still in power, right? It's just really hard to get information proving corruption 
um, to, to turn money back over if, if the government is still in power. So that's key. Um, and, and so far as Europe goes with, um, you know, kind of getting off of Russian gas, um, there's a lot of noise. It's going to take a very long time. There just are not ready alternatives at the moment. Um, and so while I think this is a, a goal, it's been a goal for a long time uh, until, you know, we've seen Germany start to refire coal plants and things like that. Um, it's really hard to see how, how Europe weans itself off of Russian gas anytime in the next call it 18 months is my guess. Thank you. And last, uh, last minute goes to Lloyd Axworthy. Lloyd, sorry, you were muted. Unmute. Okay. All right, we're back uh, local. I think that the already there is legislation that's been passed and will be presented to the G7. Uh, so we're not talking about an if what, we're talking about here and now. Key question is, is Mr. Bowder's issue, can you find it? Yes, you can. I, I don't agree with them. The fact that it's all Byzantine hidden. Uh, some of it can be very easily identified through the in, existing financial investigation and forensics. And we can certainly up our game, which is why we need a much broader international agreement to do it. The other thing I, I think we have to come to grips with is how do we rebuild a, a stronger coalition to support Ukraine? I'm very concerned that so far it's become a very small club and the large parts of the world are either indifferent or, in, or opposed to continuing uh, the major effort to retain Ukraine's sovereignty and accountability and, uh, and democracy. And I think that we're missing out. And the one reason uh, we, one we, we could begin to respond to that, I think is to come to grips with the food security issue, show that this is something in their basic interest that has to be met and that there is an international response that can be organized. I was involved in a number of international issues, landmine treaties and international courts. You can make changes internationally, but you need leadership and you need a, a coalition of both the profit and nonprofit companies uh, and governments to do it. So I think that there's a lot of room for some new thinking that goes on. And I, uh, I welcome the fact that the Congress has been uh, taking this as a stimulant to get some of that new thinking underway. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Axworthy and everyone else uh, who's joined. Uh, we are unfortunately running out of time. Uh, I will ask uh, Jason Wojcician, who is the president of the Ukrainian Canadian Bar Association and a partner at Stuart McGevely for uh, some closing remarks and acknowledgements. Uh, Jason's practice focuses on litigation, arbitration, and dispute resolution. He has uh, extensive trial and appellate experience in courts across Canada, including in Alberta and Ontario, and he litigates corporate commercial agribusiness banking and estates disputes. Uh, Jason Wojcician, please, for some closing remarks. Jacques, you are just, I just want to say on behalf of the Ukrainian Canadian Bar Association, which is the legal arm of the Ukrainian Canadian Carget, uh, Congress, my sincere thanks to Marcus for his opening remarks, Elizabeth, who did a tremendous job as a moderator, and of course our panelists, Brian, Bill, and Lloyd. I think we all benefited from the insight that each of our panelists brought to us today. And all of us, not just those of Ukrainian heritage, have a profound interest in the current geopolitical climate and the impact on not just Ukrainians, but on the rule of law and on an international stage. And I was struck by the historical perspective that we received from Lloyd in his comments with respect to the freezing of assets and repurposing them. And certainly I agree that there needs to be a coordination from an international legal community perspective and to use Lloyd's words to up our game and to pursue and repatriate those assets that we, we know are there. And certainly the inside perspective from Bill about the 
the impact of personal sanctions and chasing Mr. Putin's personal money can have is certainly invaluable. And I was struck by the comments about the both uh, billion dollar per day wash that Mr. Putin is facing with the war on Ukraine and his oil revenues and the trillion dollar rainy day fund. So obviously there is more that world leaders can do. And I think each of us in the West can do to contribute to um, helping Ukraine, including as was discussed, the international whistleblower legislation, all these efforts will certainly help Ukraine in her darkest hour. And as Brian said, I think it's important for us not to lose the, the drumbeat and to, to keep hitting the drum. And as Lloyd said, there are times when you need to harden that beat. So hopefully that time comes soon. But I want to thank again, each of our speakers for sharing their expertise and their time generously with us. And, uh, you know, Lesia Hichi started off the uh, session with some solemn introduction and a moment of silence. And I'd like to bookmark that with a uh, little upbeat remarks of Slava Ukraini, Heroim Slava, glory to Ukraine, glory to our heroes. The Ukrainian spirit and the Ukrainian nation will never be quashed. Thank you, everyone. Okay, Jason, thank, thank you. you so much. Um, and again, thank you to all our, our panelists and our moderator uh, and, and our organizing partners. Uh, the UCC will uh, continue to bring these sorts of uh, timely and, and fascinating discussions uh, to you. So please follow our social media. Uh, this this uh, panel was recorded, so it's, it's it'll be on YouTube and Facebook. So please share it with those in your circles who could not attend today. Uh, again, thank you, Yakuyu, and uh, till next time. Bye bye.